Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and before I go on, I just want to make a formal thank you to the Friends of the Alabama Archives, the Alabama Department of History, and uh, the Archives and History, and the daughters of Judge Alex A. Marks, who uh, I hear kind of started all of this and made it possible for, for us to have these kind of series. It's unfortunate that when I was in uh, Auburn, there for five years as a grad student, and I also worked with the uh, Encyclopedia of Alabama, I didn't get to come to one of these because always at noon that day, I was always working or going to class. And so um, I'm just glad I get to come now and share some things with you. I appreciate it. Well, the first thing that we're going to talk to uh, today about is where everything is located. So when I say that, what I mean is the Creek War was actually a war within a war. So um, we have the larger War of 1812, where when you think of that, a lot of that's going on either um, in the, the Great Northwest, the Old Northwest near the Great Lakes, or they're burning Washington uh, City, our, our, our national capital. But what we are concentrating on today is the Creek War, which didn't begin until late in October of 1813 and ended by the end of March in 1814, so about a six-month period. And I'll go ahead and, and talk about how that relates to um, the War of 1812. If you studied the War of 1812, you know that the two prominent Native American, American characters in American history are Tecumseh there on your uh, right and his brother, the prophet, or Tenskwatawa, on the left. Those are Shawnee people who live up north of the Ohio River at this time. And they are joining the British and trying to uh, foment a rebellion to push back the white American settlers and reclaim the land to the Appalachian Mountains. Now, some of these people actually make their way down into the American Southeast. And they do make their way to uh, talk to the Creeks and they make their way to talk to the Cherokee. And of course, my perspective through my research is through the Cherokee, so you're gonna hear that, and you've probably not heard a lot of that before. So these are some of the prominent people that are going to be involved in the discussion. Uh, on your left is Major Ridge. Now this is a much older picture of him when he went to Washington, D.C. and ha sat for his portrait. But he will become important, in fact, we call him Major Ridge because he earned that rank during the Creek War. Before that, he was just known as the Ridge. The next one is Sequoia, and if you know any Cherokee history, you know he's the only person in probably all of humankind that invented a written language for their people, and he did it in a matter of a few years. And instead of an alphabet like we use today, it's syllables of Cherokee uh, language put together and to make their words. So each each syllable has a particular character. And he did this using about 86 different characters. And within a matter of about three weeks, if you were studying these characters and you already knew how to speak Cherokee, then you could you were literate. You could you could then read and write in Cherokee. So it really changed the Cherokee people. He was in the Creek War. This was before he did the syllabary. And you see that he's got a walking cane there. Um, they believe that he was born with uh, some kind of a, maybe a foot defect uh, that kind of kept him crippled up, but it didn't stop him. He was a great marksman. He was a silversmith, a uh, great intellectual. And he was always astounded by the white man's talking leaves, and this kind of inspired him later. But he participated in the Creek War. The next one... They're uh, in the nice dapper suit, and the young man, that's uh, John Ross. And this portrait was taken um, and created a 
couple of years after the war was over. And so he becomes chief of the Cherokees later, but right now he's just an adjutant and he's keeping a lot of the records, and he's a pretty young man. So he serves in the Creek War as one of the, the lower officers. And then the man on the right is significant in that you can see he really looks like an old-timey Cherokee. He's dressed in um, the ways of the Cherokees and the fashion and the, the rings and the nose and the long earrings and all this. Uh, many of them wore those kind of ornamentations in the late 1700s. And this is George Lowry. George Lowry will later become the second chief or vice chief of the Cherokee Nation after removal. But he and then his brother John participated in the Creek War. And so these are some of the names um, that are the most prominent. Now, there were 600 different Cherokee warriors, and they fought in what is known as the Cherokee Regiment under General Andrew Jackson. And so it didn't mean that all 600 were fighting all at once. What happens is there is actually three mustering in and out periods. Uh, Back then, you didn't stay in the militia or the army for long, long periods of time. They would call you in as they needed you. And so the first period was just very short from October through uh, early January. Then those men went home. There was one group of Cherokees that stayed and guarded a particular fort for Armstrong up the Coosa River, while most of Jackson's men had left him, and he was without, basically without an army. So they had a lot of supplies sitting there at Fort Armstrong that needed to be guarded. And also they were still trying to do reconnaissance on the major group of Creeks who were still out there. And so uh, under the... Uh, uh, command of Charles Hicks, who was one of the captains, he was a Cherokee also, uh, they stayed in the field for the whole month of February. Then the third mustering in and out period occurs uh, late January through um, early April, and that includes the infamous Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And that is the mustering in and out period where most of the Cherokees come to fight alongside Jackson. Before that, it's not that big a group. So on this map, you can see some of the major battles, and I'm sure that many of you are uh, very well versed in the Creek history of this area and have heard some of their um, history about the battles and, and the civil war between the different Creek factions. I, I will call the Creek factions the National Creek and the Red Stick Creeks. The National Creeks were the faction of Creeks who uh, many of them were headmen and chiefs who, who worked very closely with the Indian agents and the U.S. government in what was called the Civilization Plan. The idea of giving up all hunting, giving up the old ways, adopting uh, individual farmsteads, um, living kind of like their white neighbors, and so taking up farming for the men and putting the women in the houses, and they would be taking up the domestic chores of white women, like weaving, for instance. And so the Red Stick Creeks didn't agree with this policy, and they saw that some of the actual head men or chiefs of the National Council were maybe uh, a little too close to the Indian agent and maybe benefiting a little bit more than uh, they agreed with. And they were listening to some of the rhetoric that was coming down from the Great Lakes region and they were listening to Tecumseh, and they were traveling back and forth, going through Tennessee. Eventually, war breaks out between these two factions, and part of this is because on the way back and forth from the Ohio River Valley, uh, some of these Creek War parties, or the, what becomes known as the Red Stick parties, 
um, they, they raid and do some killing and plundering and burning of houses. So, uh, of course, Tennessee gets up in arms with that. And they look at the red sticks as enemies. And they are afraid that in the southeast that these people will also have the backing of the British, just like the Shawnees do up in the old Northwest Territory. And they're a little nervous about that. It's not only the Tennesseans that are nervous, but also the Georgians and the people down in the Mississippi Territory. Uh, Alabama hasn't been formed as a state yet. And so what we will see is an uncoordinated effort between all of these different groups um, to hit and send military expeditions into Creek Country to suppress this rebellion. So one of the first that uh, the Cherokees are involved in, we're not going to get into the Georgia excursions, and I'm not going to get into the Mississippi Territory excursions today. But one of the main, uh, main ones that was first uh, really significant is the Battle of Tallahassee. And that is not very far away from Cherokee country. So the boundary line between what is known as the Creek Nation and the Cherokee Nation is very close to that in uh, northeast Alabama. And so the Cherokees are very concerned because they are siding with the National Creeks and they had a long 20-year war back in the or late 1700s with Dragging Canoe against the um, the new American Republic, and basically were defeated militarily when their towns were invaded and burned by people like John Sevier and James Orr. So they had put their weapons down, and they were embracing, for the most part, this civilization plan. So they agreed with the National Creeks. So they did not like it that these raiding parties by these red sticks were coming through their territory also, and they were taking some captive women and children and some slaves. They were taking them into Creek Country. And so, you know, that's a little bit too close for comfort. So there is a relatively small contingent of Cherokees that joined that first mustering in period. There's about 60 of them. They're mainly under a mixed blood Cherokee by the name of Richard Brown. And Richard Brown, that sounds very Anglo in its nature. Uh, a lot of these Cherokees who saw themselves as Cherokees had Anglicized white names because their fathers or their grandfathers had been white traders or military men or diplomats or somebody coming through Cherokee country. And some of the Cherokee women had taken them as husbands and had these children. So the children remained behind. They many times, most times, they learned the Cherokee language, they learned the Cherokee ways, and they had a Cherokee clan because it ran through the mother's side of the family. So even if you weren't full-blood Cherokee, it did not matter. In Cherokee culture, you were completely Cherokee if your mother was Cherokee. And so Richard Brown was one of these head men, and his community was very close to that border between the two nations, the Creek Nation and the Cherokee Nation. So they had um, a grand chief, a, a chief path killer. So, you know, you, you have the head men who are in charge of different communities and respected, and sometimes they'll be called chiefs, but then you have the main chief of the Cherokee, and at that time that's Path Killer, and he's living very close to that border in Turkey Town. Now, they were afraid that the Red Sticks, and they were named because of the Red War Clubs, would come calling on the Cherokee and invade them also because they knew that they were against this civil war and all this um, problems with the white neighbors. And so uh, they definitely were sending out reconnaissance parties, they were scouting, and they were working for General Jackson. And so he was coming south into what's today 
Alabama, and but they wanted to know what was there. And so they do kind of clear out some of the black warrior towns. Um, and it's not so much that these were military engagements as these were just, they get to these areas and they were abandoned. They had already been abandoned. And so the red sticks were congregating somewhere else. And so one of these places is at Tallahatchie. And this becomes a point of contention here and at Talladega in early November. So on November 3rd, uh, Jackson sends out his cavalry under John Coffey. And the Cherokees go along with him as scouts and as, as warrior soldiers. And so they encircle Tallahatchie and they make it so no one can escape. And it's very successful. Um, they kill most of the red sticks that are right there and they take some captives also. Captives are generally dealt with in two ways. The first way is they send them to Huntsville and then later take them to Nashville and jail them. The other way is to hand them over to your Cherokees. If the Cherokees catch them, then it's kind of like, okay, they're your prisoners. And uh, oftentimes they were treated as prisoners of war in the Cherokee way. So uh, we get to the Battle of Tallahatchie. Uh, Richard Brown and his group are there. They participate. And then a few days later, we get to the Battle of Talladega, uh, where today's Talladega and the racetrack is today. And so that's the next battle. Coffee was successful in this first battle, so he thought, well, I'll try the same strategy. And what he does is he comes in with the cavalry and the Cherokees once again, and they encircle the encampment. And it's at a different place this time. It is not just a, a camp where the red sticks are, but instead it's at Fort Lasley or Leslie. And that was one of the National Creek, or the I'll call them the Friendly Creek, um, who were, of course, uh, had, had relationships some mixed marriages and things with the nearby Cherokees. And so they were besieged by the Red Sticks in that little fort. It's not a fort like you would think of today. It's more like a, a small barricaded area. And so um, they were stuck there and they were probably going to lose their lives if they stayed there very long without any relief. And that's why Jackson sends coffee on down. So at Talladega, they make the, the same attempt to encircle them, and the problem is, is that they don't close the circle all the way. It's open enough in one area where a lot of the red sticks were allowed to escape. And so um, Jackson knows that this group is not the big group, uh, the group that's causing the most problems or... Um, raiding the frontier, and so he turns around and basically goes home. Now, you would think that if he's doing pretty well up to this point that he might continue on, and he had hoped to, but during this time uh, in warfare, we have to realize that the United States doesn't have a large standing army, and the militia is only for a short enlistment period. So by the time you get everybody together, you get their kits, you train and drill them, and then you march down somewhere, you have a skirmish or two, it's time to go back and go home. And so that happens. And Jackson gets very frustrated. Either he can't find enough provisioning or he can't keep his army together. And he's a man of temper, and so he displays that temper several times throughout the, the war. Now, the Cherokees, at the time that his uh, Jackson's army is basically leaving him with nothing except a few officers, uh, the Cherokees decide to stay close by. They bivouac in Wills Valley. 
Most of them do not go home to see about their crops or see about their families or replenish their supplies. Um, they stay close to Jackson and stay true to him as scouts and um, people to make sure that, that the red sticks aren't coming after them, especially with Pathkiller being so close. Jackson had made Pathkiller a colonel. Now, Pathkiller Killer was elderly, and so he wasn't in, in the field. He never went out and uh, fought alongside Andrew Jackson, but still he held a commission, and so it was very important to keep him just fine. Now, one of the things that I asked myself when I was writing my book is, why did the Cherokees join? Well, we know that they had had a failed war um, with the Chickamauga Wars at the time of the American Revolution, and that it had really devastated them. Uh, they had to slowly rebuild. So I can understand why they didn't see military um, resistance as maybe a point of contention like some of the Shawnee or the Red Sticks did. But as I read some of the literature and things that I came across and missionary accounts and letters to the, the Indian agent, some of this was twofold. One, why do young men join? Adventure, maybe to make a name for themselves. Uh, this was a way for them to, to, if they've never participated in battle, to do things that their fathers and grandfathers had done before them. And, in Cherokee culture, part of becoming a man was participating in war events. And so some of them were just out there for that. Others, and in particular, most of the, uh, the leaders of the officers within Gideon Morgan's Cherokee Regiment um, under Jackson were already blooded, you might say. They had already participated in like the early Chickamauga Wars when they were young themselves. So now they had several decades on them and they knew what they were doing. And they decided that this was very strategic in order to uh, become solid with the Americans and the new United States. And so they threw in with the United States. And what you hear throughout this, and you hear the rhetoric on both sides of the aisle, from the Cherokees, from the Indian agent, and back and forth, is that they are calling themselves a band of brothers. A band of brothers. And so they saw themselves as equals to the other soldiers that were fighting, their white Tennessean neighbors. Now, not all the white Tennessean neighbors saw it like that, unfortunately. And so we have um, not the same type of structure and discipline in that army as we do today. And so and we don't have the communication either. And so we have uh, another general. His name is Cock. And he has another general underneath him who is named uh, James White. And they're from the Knoxville area. And they're trying to make names for themselves. And they would like to not be under Jackson's thumb. And so they come into the whole fight just about now. And what happens is... Uh, a lot of the Cherokees have come with white. And they're not Richard Brown's little group. It's another group. And so they come into the Alabama area meaning to rendezvous with Jackson and his troops because he's trying to build that army back up. And instead of going and following Jackson's orders, Cock takes it on his own and sends James White down to hit one of the Hillaby Creek towns. Unbeknownst to them, the Hillabies had already surrendered to Andrew Jackson. And so, you know, they had a white flag flying. They were supposed to go in in a day or two and, and meet Jackson, and they had already given up. 
Well, the Cherokees under White and some of his soldiers from <laughs> East Tennessee come in and they hit the Hillaby village. And the Hillabies are kind of stunned. They don't offer any resistance. They thought everything was just fine. And of course, this other force coming in has no idea what's going on or that this surrender has taken place. And they kill them almost to a person. And so there's a big massacre. And of course, the Cherokees are saying, hey, you know, look what we did. We, we did this great act and all the officers were bragging on them. And word gets back to Jackson and he doesn't really act like he regrets it too much. He just kind of says, well, you know, miscommunication. Um, and so the Cherokees kind of have a black mark there. But to them and all the officers that saw how they fought, they thought they fought gallantly and that, you know, they were so good that not a shot was fired in, in resistance, not realizing the circumstances. So when we think later, and I'm jumping forward just a little bit, when we think later about why at Horseshoe Bend nobody really gives up, even though it's pretty uh, obvious what's going to happen. This is one of those reasons. Well, if you surrender to Jackson, what good is it going to do? And so, um, nevertheless, many of the Cherokees had their first uh, uh, experience in a real battle at that at that massacre. Now, I had mentioned Charles Hicks. So, of course, after the Cherokees are bivouacked and Jackson's troops go home and he has to find new ones and train new ones and get them back in the field. Um, the Cherokees stay around for that month. They're guarding Fort Armstrong. They're staying in the field. Uh, and the next thing that happens is not until late January. So we have a pretty quiet winter. Uh, and a lot of armies at this time didn't do much in the winter anyway because it's hard to provision, it's hard to move because of weather and all of this. And so uh, what we find is that the Battle of Enota Chopko is right after what we call the Battle of Amok Fall in late January. And Jackson has found out that there are large numbers of creek somewhere down past Talladega. So he starts down there. His Indian scouts have told him there's a big, massive camp of red sticks up above. So we've got to go that way. And so they head down towards the Coosa River. They get stopped at Amakfal Creek and Anotachoka Creek uh, because the red sticks have come out to meet them. They both sides take really a beating, and Jackson almost loses his artillery in one of the creeks. And if it hadn't been for some of his uh, Cherokee allies who kind of guard the cannoneers and the artillerymen to get that loose and get it up, they would have lost their artillery at that point in time. Um, and there's all kinds of accounts. Richard Brown is back again, and he's, there's accounts of him riding back and forth on his uh, sturdy Indian pony, as they call it. And what had happened to a lot of his other troops, Jackson's other troops, was they got frightened. They were green, and a lot of them, when they saw this big force coming toward them, they just hightailed it out of there to high ground and left those men with that artillery. So if it hadn't been for the Cherokees, um, those men and that cannon would have been lost. So you would think that now that they know they're there, they would just push on, but that's not the case. Instead, they have to go back to Fort Strother, get new provisions, um, hopefully get some new men, 
And by this time, we do have reinforcements from the United States Army. The 39th Infantry shows up. Um, if you know Lemuel Montgomery, if you have heard of Sam Houston, those men were in the 39th. And so they joined the militia of Jackson. And then Jackson says, now I've got enough, and now I can do this and see it through. So in March, he heads out towards Horseshoe Bend. The scouts have reported this large body of creeks and red sticks right in through here. And it's like a refugee village. Uh, a lot of the towns around them had been burnt and attacked by the Georgia militia. And, and then coming from the south, you've got people escaping the Mississippi Territory militia. And uh, there was an, uh, another Creek village that wasn't too far from right in here that was called New Yorka, named after the New York Treaty of 1790 between the Creeks and, and uh, Washington, President Washington's administration. And so Horseshoe Bend, here's the Coosa River coming down, and so it looks like a horseshoe. There's an island here, there's an island here, and right across the narrow neck is a log barricade. And this log barricade was very well constructed. They cut a lot of the trees down um, and put up logs that were taller than me in many, many places. And we'll look at a, a schematic of that in a minute. But what we see is that Jackson brings his troops right through here. So here's the barrier, and they're right in this area here. And he has the 39th coming through here. And he sends John Coffey and his cavalry all the way around the bend. So they want to make sure nobody escapes. Nobody gets away. And the Cherokees are posted about right here. Now, if you cross the Tallapoosa, this is kind of flat through here. This is where they moor their canoes when they're coming in and out. Um, then there's a high ground. You have to climb up this way. There's a, a pretty good elevation. And then a flat area here where some of the red sticks were having their medicine people and their priests doing their ceremonies and all this. But the majority of their force, the red stick force, was right behind that barricade. And so Jackson, his whole idea was to breach that barricade and knock it down with his artillery. So there's a little hill, and if you go back right about here, this is where the little hill is, and it's called Artillery Hill. If you've been out to Horseshoe Bend National Military Park, it's well marked. Um, and so, you know, they have put up their, their uh, artillery, and they start shelling the log barricade, thinking they can knock it down, and that way they can, can go across it. And one thing I haven't told you is that it's kind of, zigzagged, and so that you will be caught in any kind of, uh, uh, if you do a frontal assault, you'll be caught in a crossfire. So it's very deadly, and he doesn't want to lose a lot of men. So for about two hours, he's sitting there shelling and shelling and shelling, and the logs just stand very well across that field. Um, we don't have, at Horseshoe Bend today, they don't have a recreated uh, barricade, but they have a fence that marks where it was. So this is standing up on the hill, looking toward the barricade, and then back here is where the red sticks would have been, they thought, safely ensconced. This is down on that bend of the river where the Cherokees are. They're on this side, looking across at Tohopeka. And of course, they see makeshift homes there. They see a few women and children. Most had been removed. They were already taken out. They knew that the battle was coming, and they already removed the women away from the immediate fire. And so the Cherokees were just right there looking across. And today, if you get across there, you know, you can see there's, there's a little tour world there, and you can see that that would have been the village of Tehopica. And uh, so they weren't expecting the Cherokees to do what they did. 
And so what we will see happening is that they, uh, they make a swim across. They take and go across, three of them. They come back and they start ferrying warriors across in some of the Red Sticks canoes until they had a fighting force. They go and once Jackson hears what the Cherokees did on their own, they did not have orders from Jackson, then he orders a frontal assault on the barricade. And of course, the, the deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat quickly ensues. Now, most of the wounds that the Cherokee were either um, killed by or uh, were injured by were from uh, gunshots. One had a tomahawk hawk wound on his hand. But once you shoot your gun, if you don't have time to load it, guess what? It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, this is one of the maps that you've probably seen before. And again, it's just an older map. Here's the barricade. Here's the river, and that's where the Cherokees would have been coming across. Or, I'm sorry, there's, there's the barricade. And then this is a military map from the Park Service. So, I mean, there's different views. So this is where the Cherokees crossed, and this is Artillery Hill, and again, there's the log barricade. Now, after the war, because Horseshoe Bend basically ended the Creek War, there weren't but a handful that actually escaped that day. The famed uh, Red Stick Chief Manawa is one of the few that did. Um, but you would think that the Cherokees would have been rewarded in, in one way or another. Instead, they were required to give some sessions of land, as were the, the Choctaws who had fought with the Americans, as the Chickasaws were. Um, and even the National Creeks were, had to give up land. Altogether, they gave up 20 million acres, which makes up a lot of Alabama today and, and Georgia. The Cherokees, all they had left was this little bit right here, right here. And we can see, though, that there's been a trend right from right after the Creek War uh, all the way up to the removal period, lots and lots of land sessions. So it's every tribe that was east of the Mississippi River they wanted out of there. And then with the Indian Removal Act in 1830, um, that's what happens. They expect everybody to make a treaty with the U.S. government and go. This is what the Cherokee Nation looked like in 1825, and, and you can see it's uh, divided up into districts, but uh, two years later they have a constitution, they have a bilingual newspaper thanks to Sequoia, they have a Supreme Court modeled after the U.S. Supreme Court, the whole thing. So a very civilized group, uh, just exactly what that civilization plan was, was trying for. And it did not stop the removal. Uh, most of the Cherokees were removed. They were one of the last holdouts in 1838. In the winter of 1839, they, uh, they end up making the journey to Indian Territory. And all this time, they were resisting, and I mean, there's U.S. Supreme Court cases that are involved. Um, there's a land, a land lottery by Georgia. There's all kinds of things going on. But the, the, one of the things I want to bring out and how this ties together is that those that, that fought in the Creek War end up being many of the resistance leaders. And even Major Ridge was one that signed the Treaty of New Chota against the wishes of his nation. And so that's what caused them to remove. But up until that time, it's like... But we fought with you. We did what you wanted. You want us to become civilized. There's all this evidence that we have. Uh, we have been good neighbors. We've been good allies. We've shed blood together. Um, it was in every one of their memorials and delegates, on the delegates' tongues and speeches, to even Jackson, and pretty much it just fell on deaf ears. This is the whale, who was one of the men who swam the Tallapoosa River to bring back that first canoe. That's his bandolier bag. It's now at the Gilcrease Museum. And 
It's not to say that nobody appreciated what the Cherokee did. At the time, there were a few newspaper articles that thanked them for their service. Some of the officers wrote letters thanking them for their service and their valiant uh, contributions. This is uh, a rifle that was uh, commissioned by the President of the United States and given to Whale, um, thanking him for his valiant service. Oh, by the way, he didn't get the original one. It somehow just disappeared between here and there, and so they had to redo another one. And so uh, I just wanted to mention one other thing, because you may have a question about this. And we had one other warrior who was a private at the time. His name is June Alaska. And June Alaska uh, was from the Snowbird community area of Graham County, Western North Carolina. And he was one of the few that came only towards the very end of the war. He didn't participate in the early battles, but he was there at Horseshoe Bend. And they say that he saved Andrew Jackson's life. There's no documentation that proves that. The family history supports it still to this day. And he became a captain after the war of the Light Horse, which is like a, a law enforcement uh, on horseback in the Cherokee Nation. So they honor him yet today, and this is uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokees who did not have to remove. And the North Carolina legislature in 1847 actually made uh, Junaleska a citizen of the state even though the Eastern Band was still kind of not recognized. So uh, if one good thing came out of it, it was that they thought he saved Andrew Jackson's life. And so he got some land and he got some money from that. So that's all I have, except I will be glad to take any questions that you have. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Dr. Abrams. Thank you. If you have a question, please raise your hand and either myself or Mary Beth will pass you the microphone. We are recording today's session for our YouTube channel. All right, here we go. Pass that down to me, please. Yes, ma'am. What was the Cherokee's method of freedom POWs, as you mentioned? In your, like okay, their traditional way was oftentimes to turn them over to the women. And so women that had lost kin in battles, it didn't matter if you were the perpetrator of that, um, they would still kind of take life for life. That was the old blood law way to do it. But the women would ridicule and dehumanize and demasculinize uh, the, the captives. And there were incidents of that being done when some of the Cherokee prisoners were taken to preach, peach tree the Peachtree area of uh, Georgia. And I will also mention that at uh, Fort, Armstead, Fort Armstead, they had a dance ground or a little small council ground that they built there. There were uh, uh, burnings. There were torturings, uh, beatings. And then sometimes they would just kill that person. Uh, they had the option to adopt them, but that didn't happen in this war. Um, there were other captives that they took, like the Creek women and children, and many of them ended up in Cherokee households as slaves. And some of them escaped later. Um, and I imagine some of them ended up marrying and staying into the household. So that was the closest. But as far as the males were concerned, they were... Uh, tomahawked or clubbed over the head or eventually. Um, and, and those warriors wouldn't have wanted to go any other way, to be honest with you. That was, that was the, the brave way to go. Um, and so there were 250 women that were captured in those first two battles, and they were scattered all over the Cherokee Nation. I will, I will say that there were also some children taken out of Creek Country that end up being uh, brought to white folks' homes. Andrew Jackson was one of those. He takes and raised as a young uh, Creek orphan, and his name becomes Lincoya, uh, who doesn't fit into either world, really. He seems to be kind of a tortured soul. He dies pretty early. 
Um, and there were other children that were taken. And it's almost like when you read the letters, at first you think, oh, well, that's nice. They're taking this child in. And they do give these children some opportunities, but not quite the same that they give their own children. So it wasn't like we think of adoption back then. Anybody else? About how many Creek Indians were killed during this war? I don't really have all the numbers because I've only studied the Jackson era, uh, but it's it's in the thousands. It's several thousand. Um, in, in fact, you Creek historians out there, you may have that number if you do. Feel free to share it. Uh, at Horseshoe Bend, it was over 900 that were killed. <laughs> My grandfather, William Van, was descended from Chief Van, and he came from Georgia. Um, I'm talking about early 1900s, late 1800s, very late. Um, so uh, I was just wondering, there must have been other groups that were not removed. Um, the Vans were actually removed. Their land was given away in the Georgia land lottery. He lost his plantation and, and all that, so they had to remove. Uh, now, during the Creek War, one of his relatives was Avery Van, and he lived very close to today's um, Alabama-Georgia border, and he wasn't rich like his relative. He, he was just in a log cabin. Uh, the Creeks came, the Red Stick Creeks came, and they burned Ave Van's house down. So there were raids that, uh, and I had mentioned that they were afraid that the Red Stick uh, skirmishes would spill into the domestic areas of Cherokee Nation, and that's one instance of that. Uh, but the Vans, for the most part, were removed. Now, today it's a, a state historic site. You can actually visit his his plantation house. It's a, it's a beautiful place out in Chatsworth, Georgia. When you had the uh, portraits up toward the beginning of your presentation, the one on the far right appeared to have a, some kind of medallion that looked like maybe President Jackson. Let's see. That's it. Yeah, the one on the right. It does. I don't think it's Jackson. Yeah, but those are called peace medals, and they were oftentimes given to uh, very important headmen or chiefs that uh, were treaty negotiators. It was a goodwill type thing. Um, I really can't make that out to see who it is, but. That's one of those peace medals. In the old day, those kinds of gorgets would be carved out of shell. Like if you've looked at some of the Mississippian period uh, shell work that's up upstairs in the gallery, um, that's what these are supposed to be reminiscent of. But it's, it's almost like instead of having a peace treaty that you sign, it's a, a, a goodwill gesture to the native peoples. And it's supposed to be friendship and honor. Okay. Um, do you ever help people with genealogy who are researching Creek and Cherokee ancestors? Or do you know who does? Uh, well, we do have a genealogist uh, on the Koala Boundary there in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, you can contact her. Uh, we have really good libraries there at Western Carolina University, the Hunter Library, or uh, the library over in Silva, the county library, or there's the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, which has an archives there, as well as the Koala Boundary Public Library. And they have some genealogical records. They don't do it for you, but they can help you maybe get started with some of that. But a lot of that has to do with government roles. And census is taken for not genealogical purposes, but for uh, treaty obligations, either counting, for instance, um, who has what or where you are if you're getting ready to get removed, valuations, that sort of thing. 
Cherokee Nation, the same way. They have, uh, they have good genealogical records there too. In fact, I think they have a genealogical society. You said in your lecture near the end that the whale, for his participation in the war, received a rifle. Did any other of the Cherokee warriors receive anything from the government, like a pension or something? They received pensions, absolutely. Uh, especially, well, some of them received disability pensions, let me put it that way. If you were injured and you had gone to a U.S surgeon that was there with the military and had your uh, injuries documented and your disability documented, then you were liable to have, uh, you were able to have a disability pension just like a U.S. soldier was. And even Jackson pushed for equal pay for these soldiers. So uh, a private in the Cherokee Regiment would earn the same amount per month as one of his white militia soldiers, Tennessee militia soldiers, so they made $8 a month. Now with the disability pensions, uh, the problem was getting them. I mean, yes, they said they would pay you, but the problem was getting that money. And it wasn't until uh, 1842, which was well after the removal, that uh, these veterans got their monies. But it was the same way with the white soldiers too. So it's, it's the Congress, it said that's the way it would go down, but they didn't actually um, legislate for the money till later. So many of those people were already dead by that time, but it would go to their widows or their next in line. We have time for one more question. I just wanted to say that my husband's grandmother was one of those Cherokee children that was taken from their family and raised in an orphanage for training. And uh, these two boys right here are some of, the, some of her ancestors. Now, when did that happen? I, I really don't know. It's like... Was that on the Trail of Tears or b before that? No, it was... Uh, my husband's father was an Oklahoma chair, registered Oklahoma Cherokee. Okay, okay. So it and could it have been his, after the Civil War, too, then. It was his mother. They had lots of orphans after yeah. the Civil well, she War. she wasn't an orphan. That She was taken from her parents. Oh, actually taken. Well, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the Cherokees that might have been taken, but the Cherokees, uh, even before all of this, they had a habit of going out west anyway. So they knew some of them hunted bison out that way and they would skirmish with the Osage Indians and then occasionally they would bring Osage children back with them and some of them ended up in the mission schools and being adopted by Cherokee families so I mean that was very common within society you hear more about it that way than you do going having Indian children taken and raised her name was Narcissa okay was that Narcissa Owen Smith no, I don't oh, think okay. so. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. She went on the Trail of Tears when she was three, and so later on she, she did a memoir of that. We go to Oklahoma every May for a family reunion, and we look at all the tombstones and all the names, and that's one that I remember. It's fascinating. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.